I knew I wanted to do genetic engineering. You know, I was like 14 years old or something. This is Jason Kelly, co-founder and CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks, a biotech company. Jason has been mesmerized by the possibilities of genetic engineering since he was a teenager devouring sci-fi books and movies. So after high school, Jason arrived at MIT ready to learn how to turn science fiction into reality. I distinctly remember getting the course catalog for MIT and flipping through it, looking for the genetic engineering classes. In my mind, you know, you were going to get to go in there and like change the DNA of plants and they would like turn different colors. By the early 2000s, major advancements were happening in the field. Scientists had figured out how to genetically modify plants, clone animals, and even map the full human genome. But Jason quickly learned there were still limits. Breakthroughs didn't happen overnight. And work in the lab could be frustrating. You would spend a whole summer trying to do one experiment by hand at the lab bench to move a gene from one organism to another and fail. And it was just demoralizing. But Jason was undeterred. He started a PhD in biological engineering. The core idea behind synthetic biology is that DNA is code. It's digital code, right? It's ATCs and Gs, not zeros and ones like you would see in a computer. But but you could read that code with DNA sequencing. Jason joined a student organization called the MIT Synthetic Biology Working Group where he met other students who were just as excited about the possibilities of programming cells with DNA. It was such a ragtag group of weirdos. They they were all these people that were essentially engineers coming into biology and being like, hey, it's code, maybe we could program it. And then a bunch of biologists who were like, you guys are fools, okay? You know, right, like biology is way too complicated for that. At the time, Jason says a lot of his colleagues basically told the engineers that this all sounded like total science fiction. I mean, we're talking about altering the function of cells to make vastly different organisms. But a small fraction of us biologists will tolerate talking to you because we kind of see the the vision and we'll commune and we'll learn a little more about engineering and you'll learn a lot more about biology and maybe we'll find like a middle ground. Through that collaboration, Jason and those ragtag weirdos began seeing the power of the relationship between biology and computer science, and the possible implications of modifying and manufacturing organisms. The reason people get excited about synthetic biology is we know what biology is capable of. Just think about the basics of biology. A seed goes into the ground, add air, water, sunlight. Out of thin air, a thing starts to appear. Carbon is pulled out of the air, self-assembled. Solar panels are built in the leaves to harvest energy. Uh, And then it just starts manufacturing pieces of nanotechnology. As in the tiny cellular processes that eventually yield flowers, fruit, and so on. Now, here's the problem. That thing evolved over four billion years just to to be a petunia. It's not making a life-saving medicine or some type of new uh, chip material or, you know, other things that humans might want. It's It's just there. The idea is, well, if if you could then change the DNA code inside that plant, you could make it manufacture anything. By the time Jason wrapped up his PhD at MIT, he had assembled a team made up of three other grad students and one professor who believed in the vision. No one got involved because they thought that this all was going to work and be a big deal. They got involved because... They were, we were zealots. We were in love with the idea that, you know, DNA could be designed and programmed and you could work with living cells as, as like a substrate, you know, to, to do engineering, to do design and art. Jason and his team launched Ginkgo Bioworks in 2008. And over the last few years, economic and technological trends have allowed science and technology to meld in ways previously unimaginable. And the science fiction future that Jason had long envisioned is fast becoming an astonishing reality. I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And this is Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. Josh, you're a computer programmer. What do you think of Jason's vision? Have you ever thought about programming a plant or a living thing? Um, well, I'm no expert, but... You know, when you look at how DNA is structured, it it seems to make sense, right? There's discrete components, they interact in certain ways. It's just that the the levels of complexity are, you know, exponentially much farther Manifold. along. Yeah. Right. Anyway, on the other hand, 
Massive data complexity is something we've made huge strides in over just the last decade or two. And as a result, now we're starting to see things like um, cancer vaccines that are designed specifically for a, a certain person's genome, or I mean, even the COVID vaccine. And that's come such a long way for fighting disease. We just, in a broader sense, have come a long way in understanding the natural world and also the technology at our fingertips. So whether it's synthetic biology or medical advancements, like how quickly scientists developed the vaccines that we've seen, the pace of change is really breathtaking. It is, and technology is driving science and science is in turn driving technology. And that's resulting in more and more enterprises that are pushing how they innovate, that are harnessing the power of science and melding it with technology. So today we're gonna explore that relationship and how it brings about new opportunities for businesses, for industries, for everyone. If you look at World War II, when we learn important lessons related to uh, relationship between science and technology. This is Mark Carell Billiard, Global Senior Managing Director at Accenture R&D Labs. Mark reminds us that during World War II, humanity saw some major scientific developments like the atomic bomb and radar. At the end of the war, a report was given to the U.S. president, and it was titled Science, the Endless Frontier. The government report called for more scientific research that would drive technologies, and it actually led to a period of innovation and key breakthroughs. One was the invention of the transistor. The transistor began as a super basic electrical component for switching a current on and off and for amplifying an electrical signal, like the transistor radio. Scientific breakthrough was needed to make a transistor that actually worked. And in 1946, a physicist made that breakthrough and built a working transistor the next year. And the first transistor computer seven years after that. But this milestone happened only after a marked effort to advance scientific research, figure out how to develop the technology, and then companies building products and sharing them with the world. What we learn is that there's a relationship between science and technology, and it's, it's really a bi-directional feedback loop. Okay? When you accelerate advances in one, you accelerate the other. Think about it like this. It took centuries for humans to develop their understanding of physics to the point where we could get ourselves into outer space. And while science accelerated technological development after World War II, technology also started to accelerate science. Rocket technology allowed us to get to the moon. And when we went to the moon, then basically we started to learn more about our planet, about basically what's around us. Let's say you find new compound on the moon, or maybe you find new substrate. And that compound or substrate could become the key component to a new type of processor in the future, or even a new type of fuel. And so science will help you basically to create like a new future technology. And that new future technology will help science again. And then the cycle repeats. That's the feedback loop, fueling innovation and pushing the bounds of what's possible. When the pandemic happened, there was a real urgency to get a vaccine developed. Within a matter of months of the first case of COVID, scientists sequenced the genome of the virus, and before long, they were ready to begin vaccine trials. And by the end of that same year, the mRNA vaccine was ready to distribute. The reason why we've been able to accelerate on, on COVID is that because we have a lot of data, not only like real data from patients, but we could build also synthetic data. And then we have a lot of artificial intelligence also to help us basically to do drug discovery. And all the things that we've learned for uh, fixing COVID will be reused, obviously, to create vaccines for cancer and for other diseases. It was actually enterprise involvement in science and technology that helped roll out the mRNA vaccine so quickly. For example, a company that specializes in automation helped vaccine manufacturers digitize every step of production before it even began, so they could plan and execute the process in record time. They used a technology called digital twins, which Mark says is part of a bigger trend that's shifting the landscape in medicine and across pretty much every other industry, the merging of the digital world and the physical world. Digital twin is really like the twin of yourself, the twin of your equipment, the twin of any process, and they're gonna be helping basically to drive what we have in the physical world. Imagine that your car has a digital twin. 
Think a digital model that includes every single part of the engine, the brakes, the wheels, the computer, everything, down to the electrical components. And you're out and about driving your car each day, and the vehicle's performance is synced up to the digital twin in real time. The garage that's going to be monitoring your car or doing the maintenance, they know up front what's happening with your car because every time you drive your car, the car is sending data. So they know they can give you a phone call. So it's like, hey, come, come with your car because we need to fix this and this. If we do that for car and we do that today for planes, why won't we do that for your, your own body? Because I think it's more precious than your car or a plane. Mark says that even though we're not able to build full digital twins of our own bodies yet, the science is moving us closer and closer to that reality every day. Something that we have worked on in our lab in Dublin is working on Alzheimer and predicting cognitive decline of patients with this Alzheimer. The process begins by building digital models of a specific set of a patient's genes, and then combines that with both real data and synthetic data to project the patient's outlook, working out all the kinks with the help of scientists. We talked to experts in this domain, and our interest was really to match or to compare what our digital twin model could come up with in terms of progression for different individuals to what they would be finding for exactly those individuals over time. And that model predicted real-world progression of the disease with 82% accuracy. Now, have we solved the problem? No, we haven't solved the problem. But I think the breakthrough moment right now is just like, it's a combination of things, you know? We talk about AI, we talk about hardware. The thing is, AI, novel hardware, new means of communication, all of these things are becoming more and more integrated into the day-to-day -day operations of almost every industry. So what does that mean for business? I think this is the opportunity to rethink from the ground up of everything that we've been building. And so it's like, it's now the moment. Because the, I think this is a great opportunity to reinvent our process, reinvent our product, and reinvent the way we're communicating and, and we live and we work. But it's not gonna be easy. If businesses want to benefit from the advancements that'll emerge from science and technology in the years ahead, they'll have to re-examine their structures and prepare to make big changes. Companies need to reinvent themselves. And reinventing themselves is not like trying to build something they've done with legacy environment. They need to rethink, reshape completely their thinking about the future. Because the science technology feedback loop moves fast and to keep up, businesses will have to approach it with true scientific spirit. One of the key elements here is collaboration with both great scientific minds and with other enterprises working alongside them. You need to be very curious uh, to, to build bridges and to start experimenting, especially through those collaborative relationship. In the business space, this can happen in the form of a consortium to accelerate quantum computing technology, for example, or a bioengineering company partnering with a food manufacturer to bring new products to market. Businesses also need to seriously consider education, providing an abundance of opportunities to learn about the possibilities that this new era of innovation will open up. And it's not just about educating people who already work in science and tech. If you educate the business people, then people understand the power of technology and how this technology, if we explain that very simply, can have a huge impact on their business. The truth is, a lot of the technology fueling this feedback loop is already out there. For businesses, it comes down to finding people, both employees and collaborators, who know how to use it. Change the mindset. Everything is possible to do. Connect with the right people, the right partners, and then test things uh, as much as, as you can. Because building a new mindset, along with the tools and the connections to drive change, that's going to be what ultimately makes innovation in science and technology happen. But it's still worth approaching with a level of care and attentiveness to what this pace of change could mean. A lot of progress we've made in technology has, you know, like there's always like positive uh, outcome and there's always negative outcome. I think we need to look at the negative outcome up front and try to be always like responsible and have like an ethical mindset. That means baking responsibility into everything you build and thinking about the future, the long-term implications, because the science and technology feedback loop moves fast. I always used to say that we are living a, another century of renaissance. And I wish I'm younger than I am, 
because I've seen that in the last 20 years, an amazing progress of science through technology and vice versa. I don't know what I should expect in the next 20 years, but I think that's going to be extraordinary. Josh, pop quiz. Can you think of a big scientific discovery that changed our lives and society in a major way? Uh, That's a long list. Uh, Actually, no, I know of one. I was talking recently to a senior executive who asked his grandmother, who was like 102, what the most transformational technology she had seen in her lifetime was. And he was thinking it would be cars or electricity or radio. And she said it was Velcro. (laughs) Apparently that just changed everything for her. What about for you? For me, probably the internet, you know, just the fact yeah. that we had this global distribution network for for information. What about you? I would think of something synthetic, right? Like I was thinking milk pasteurization uh, mm. or medicines, that kind of direction. But in again and again, in all of these, there's that feedback loop that really emerges where you can't have new technology without investing in research and development, in the science that then drives that technology. And then you can't make new scientific discoveries without technology and tools. And that's true for so many of these big scientific discoveries that have changed our lives. Yeah, very true. And this sounds a lot like the attitude that Jason Kelly and his colleagues set out with when they founded Ginkgo Bioworks, right? Yeah. So let's go hear more about their vision for bringing lessons from computer science into the field of biotechnology. In tech, there's this whole culture of like, Kids drop out of school, start companies. Biotech's not like that. Like, we're actually quite rare to have started out of school. After wrapping up their PhD program at MIT in 2008, Jason and his team were eager to get their ideas off the ground. While many of their peers were headed for research positions or the pharmaceutical industry, Jason and his Ginkgo team set to work on programming cells like computers and building a business around it. If you can read and write a code, and then you have a machine that can run it. So you can think of a cell, you know, as being able to execute this code, you could program. And then it turns out once you believe that, you realize the tools to do it are horrible. Our ability to design is terrible. It, it, these aren't computers. We didn't design them, so we don't know how they worked. Uh, and, and so there's all these problems. And so a lot of what Ginkgo was designed as a company to do was solve all those problems so that we could realize a vision of, of being able to design biology. Their plan was to build all the tools to rewrite DNA and alter the function of a cell, put their tools in a lab, and then open that lab up to other companies or researchers who didn't know how to go about executing their big ideas. We're basically saying the way you do biotech R&D today at you know, big pharma company, big ag company, big industrial company, is you have a small team of scientists with lots of fancy equipment in a lab working by hand. You come to my facility here in Boston, we have 250,000 square feet of highly uh, automated robotic labs that are doing that work. And I say, just use it as a service rather than build that lab on your own site. This was a notably different approach to the way the biotech industry had done things in the past. So it came with a lot of unknowns. So there was a six year period where mostly people just thought we were crazy. It took another 10 years before, you know, industry and venture folks didn't think it was crazy. Over time, the idea that recoding DNA could have useful industrial applications became more and more accepted in the business space. And eventually, markets opened up. For example, startups with ideas about how to improve food products and therapeutics started to look into ways to harness biotech. And by that time, Ginkgo was ready to lead the charge, showing that if you organize yourself around the future, then you'll be ready when it arrives. So like one of the things we're doing at Ginkgo is we're essentially bringing Uh, a tech industry platform business model into biotech. From the outset, Jason and his colleagues were passionate about bringing lessons from computer engineering into the science of bioengineering. And by that same token, they looked to structures from the computing and tech industry as they built their biotech company, essentially a feedback loop between computer science and emerging biotechnology. Jason even compares Ginkgo's operations today to the role of cloud computing in the 90s. Back then, if you wanted to start an internet site, you had to buy a bunch of big servers, put them in a room, and hire a big IT staff to run those servers. And along comes the cloud computing companies, and they say, forget that, use us. We'll build a data center next to a dam where the power is cheap, and we'll build it like a factory. And at the time, the companies would say, I don't want to outsource to that. Like, I'm afraid of that new technology. Like cloud computing, Ginkgo's approach is a disruption of the way things have always been. 
And keep in mind, developments in both computer science and biology have huge implications for the way we do business. But they have one key difference. Okay. Big difference between cells and computers, though. They are both programmable. Computers move information around, which means what industries did they disrupt? Finance, telecom, media, everything that involves bits, that involves information. Cells are programmable. They don't move information around. They move atoms. So what industries are they going to disrupt? All the physical goods industries. If you're in a physical goods industry, you're in a biotech industry, and you just don't know it yet. Ginkgo is already working with businesses in the physical goods industry who want to tap into the technology. For example, one of their partners is a company that's trying to reinvent the way deodorant works on a microbial level. They wanted to figure out a way to make the bad smelling microbes go away and replace them with good smelling microbes that our bodies naturally produce. So their CEO joined Ginkgo as an entrepreneur in residence at Ginkgo's labs and spent two years researching a way to program our microbiomes rather than just masking them with harsh chemicals. Instead of like fighting your biology, it's more like, you know, communing and getting in touch with your biology. I think that's like a really exciting, totally new area. This is a lesson in the power of collaboration, which is a driving force in the feedback loop between science and technology. And the possibilities are immense. For example, in industrial agriculture, there's a process called Haber-Bosch. It involves pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere at big chemical plants that burn a ton of fuel to combine that nitrogen with hydrogen to make ammonia, a key component of soil fertilizers. You put it in a bag, ship it to farmers, they put it on their field, right? And you know, half goes you know, off into a, a river or something. The crop gets some. So you have a local environmental problem with the runoff. You have a global greenhouse gas problem, but we gotta eat, right? You know, like without synthetic fertilizer, we wouldn't be able to feed you know, 8 billion people on the planet. But here's the thing. There are some crops that can do this Haber-Bosch process by themselves. Soybeans, for example, can pull nitrogen out of the air and self-fertilize without all the runoff or pollution. So what if other, more common crops like corn, wheat, or rice could also self-fertilize? And so what we're doing is we're reading the DNA code of the microbes that live on soy and other, other legumes, finding the code that gives them that superpower to produce fertilizer, and then moving that code into microbes that live on corn uh, and these other crops. They haven't perfected the process just yet, but they have the tools for companies to work to change everything from fertilizer to fragrances to food. What we've always been passionate about is, is driving the improvement of the underlying platform infrastructure. But we then say, hey, customers, we would love you to go out and have impact in the world using this platform. Ginkgo's platform gives their partners and customers access to the tools that rewrite DNA. They come to the lab with an idea and work with ginkgo scientists to make it a reality, broadening what biology is capable of by democratizing the technology. Jason also sees this new era of biotech as a major opportunity for education. We have a vision that, you know, your kids someday should be able to engineer the plants in your garden to make them more beautiful. Like in the way you have a personal computer and you program it and you become computer literate, like you are English literate. We want you to become like DNA literate so that you too can design your garden. Technological and economic advances in recent years have accelerated the innovation in synthetic biology. And with collaboration and education, the sci-fi future that Jason dreamed about as a teenager will be here sooner rather than later. And so I think everyone's got that opportunity right now with synthetic biology, because it is the absolute infancy in terms of it's actually getting out into the real world and impacting companies. So that, in that sense, it's, it's the most exciting time it's ever been. Josh, did you realize that computers and the life sciences had so much in common? I mean, I think I knew about it tangentially, but mm -hmm. these examples really drive at home. I mean, that all the the mastery that we've felt over the last few decades around building stuff and putting it on the internet, yeah. now we can do that with cells? Right, right. And it's cool because it sounds like the technology Ginkgo came up with could shake up a lot of industries in similar ways to how the internet did. Yeah, yeah. And it offers an opportunity for collaboration with other folks who want to make these kinds of breakthroughs happen across different industries, but who need a little help with the science. 
So we've talked about one new frontier in science and technology, synthetic biology. But believe it or not, it's not the only area where innovation (laughs) is happening at a record pace. That's right. There's a lot of exciting business developments happening out in the final frontier, too, outer space. So now we're going to hear from a company that's not only making space tech more accessible, but also is finding new ways to use their discoveries to push scientific research here on the ground. We don't realize how much of space data and space services we actually use in our day-to-day life. Just this morning, did you check the weather? Uh, All of that is probably based on space data. This is Rafael Jorda Siquier, founder and CEO of Open Cosmos. He started his company with an ambitious goal to build and launch affordable satellite-based products and services. Open Cosmos designs, manufactures, and operates a wide range of satellites in orbit. We have done telecommunication satellites, we have done Earth observation satellites, and we have recently also started delivering some of the new generation of navigation satellites. When Rafael was an aerospace engineering student in the late 2000s, building satellites was still a cumbersome and extremely costly task. Back in the early days, engineers had to focus a lot on redundancy, which makes the satellites bigger, more expensive, and it takes a lot longer to manufacture Because of this, space programs and access to space data was limited mainly to a handful of government organizations. But with a small group of fellow college students, Rafael worked on a school project that showed him the possibilities of how things could be. We put a camera on board of an helium balloon that went to the edge of the stratosphere. And we took high resolution pictures from there. You could see the curvature of Earth and it just looked like if it was an image taken from the International Space Station. And that really inspired us because we literally did that with 300 euros, uh, a bit more than $300. (laughs) He realized that getting quality data from space technology didn't have to be so out of reach. To make that data more accessible, aerospace technology companies needed to think differently about the products and services they provided. And that's exactly what began to happen in the industry. Technological innovations and falling costs brought growth in the private sector. Access opened up. I was just seeing the change of paradigm start to happen in front of my eyes. There has been a massive miniaturization of these satellites and more more abundant launch capabilities. So Rafael founded Open Cosmos to join the effort. And soon, their team began developing satellites with a unique approach. We designed each one of the subsystems, the power unit, the onboard computer, the wiring, the structure, the solar panels. And using these pre-built modules, they could assemble satellites specific to each customer's needs, excluding any unnecessary parts. You can think of it like putting all of the pieces together to provide the data that the customer will need. And we do all of that in months, no longer in years. Open Cosmos's innovation mindset resulted in less expensive, quicker development cycles. And Rafael says that processes like their modular approach, coupled with exciting changes in the aerospace industry, has led to the increased accessibility of space data that he dreamt of. Now, you don't need to spend 200 million in one satellite. You don't need to wait a decade to get your satellite in orbit like it used to. And the proliferation of satellites in the atmosphere today means... The business uses are a lot wider and a lot more effective. Data from these satellites can be used across various industries. Take the agriculture industry, for example. One of the key things that you can do with Earth observation satellites, it's monitor the yields from natural resources, right? So you can see how much of a certain crop it's going to be produced and do estimations of that, how much water is it going to be consumed. That kind of data can be crucial for budgeting at a large scale. The applications are numerous and potentially urgent. So when there is a critical situation like an earthquake or a wildfire, you want to have that information in as close to real time as possible, right? So the people on the ground can take decisions effectively on on how to use the humanitarian aid or, or how to reach a particular location. So that's one of the domains where satellite capabilities are extremely useful. 
First responders using space data during emergencies is just one example of how insights from space can improve life on Earth. Satellite technology can be a game changer for businesses, and just as Jason Kelly of Ginkgo envisions biotechnology, you can invest in satellite infrastructure just like you may invest in a cloud infrastructure or in servers. Satellites are just becoming a tool. And even though it sounds like very far-fetched and technologically advanced, which indeed they are, but it's not a futuristic thing. This opens so many doors. New tools and processes that can facilitate cross-industry collaboration between aerospace and countless industries. Just like with biotechnology, education and collaboration will be key for businesses to take advantage of the science technology feedback loop in the space economy. What we want is this technology, this infrastructure, to be used by people outside of the space sector or the scientific community. Imagine if only scientists had used computers. We definitely wouldn't be living in the society that we live these days. Emerging science and technology can't make an impact if it just stays with the people who created it. Companies should invest in these tools early to reinvent themselves for the future. What does the energy industry need? The agriculture world? What do all of these other industries need that we can serve effectively from satellites? I truly believe that it's going to enable growth and enable sustainability in a way that both we deeply need and that has never seen before. These new developments in satellite technology seem like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to space exploration and making outer space more accessible, right? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like they aren't just spearheading this effort to get satellites up into space. They're also making the whole industry more accessible for everyone else on the ground. Yeah, there's a lot of new research opportunities on the horizon and even recreational travel, which is wild. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. So... Could you see yourself traveling to space someday? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Sign me up. How about yourself? Would you go up? So long as I had all my material comforts, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about what we can continue to expect as this science technology feedback loop carries us into the future. Absolutely. So to learn more about what we covered in today's episode, download the Accenture Foresight app. There you'll find the Tech Vision 2023 report, which also talks about new developments in digital identity and generative AI, and how this technology will transform work and reinvent business overall. Big thanks to Accenture's Mark Carell Billiard. And to Jason Kelly and Rafael Giorgio Cinquer for talking to us. Built for Change is a podcast from Accenture. More episodes are coming soon. Follow, subscribe, and if you like what you hear, leave us a review. <laughs>